So, um, 12 years ago, when many of you helped me become uh, the first person of the Muslim faith to be a member of Congress, um, it was uh, by no means a certain thing that was going to happen. I had a tough campaign back then, 2006. Uh, I had to fight through a lot of things, had to fight through a lot of lies. And, some things that were true, but were distorted. <coughs> Somehow we, we came out, we won, and uh, alhamdulillah, it was 12 years ago. So, Delara, I don't know if you, you, you realize, but you and I met quite a few years ago and been working together and uh, all that time. But on uh, January 3rd, um, there won't be one Muslim, there'll be three. I will not be one. So that's. That's moving forward. Um, two of the three will be female. Mm -hmm. Two of the one will be a refugee of Somali descent uh, who wears hijab, and another will be the daughter of Palestinian refugees who grew up in the Michigan, uh, the Southeast Michigan area. So things uh, they're changing. That's just Congress. And by the way, Congresses can be kind of a deceiving indicator of political progress because the real action is on the ground. Um, think about all the state legislators. I don't know the whole story in Illinois, I'd love to hear it, but I can tell you in Minnesota, uh, we're losing Ilhan out of the state legislature, but we're gaining Mahmoud Noor and Hoda Hassan. And we have a city council member named Abdi Warsami, there's a um, school board member named Said uh, Ali Said, Said Ali, sorry. And then there's several others. One uh, young man ran in a, in a very, very uh, white suburb, white Christian suburb, came within 150 votes of winning. He ran in one of those districts where people would tell him, she ain't gonna win. But he, he came that close. He came so close, he's already planning on his next one. So that's a lesson too. Yes, we run, we want to win, absolutely. But always understand that you can win in more than one way. Sometimes driving a dialogue, raising issues others don't want to bring up, mobilizing voters that felt left out can be a very important victory, even if by the time the votes are counted, you didn't have the most. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to, to keep at it uh, and uh, Delara, I want to thank you because you ran, ran a great race, so I was proud to endorse you. Uh, but uh, you're still here organizing, and that's really what it's all about. I ran for the Democratic National Committee chair. I didn't win. I became deputy chair. My attitude was this. Hey, I'm trying out for quarterback, but if I don't make it, I'll play running back. That's it. Whatever it takes to help the team win. And so we do what we have to do. There's a lot at stake for the Muslim community for all the whole, the whole of the United States. The whole of the United States. I mean, uh, I can tell you that the hate movement in the United States has got a new breath of life under the president. The hate movement has got a new breath of life under the president. In Minnesota, we had a master, Ma, master Abu Bakr. No, 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 Darrell Farouk, sorry, my bad. Darrell Farouk was literally bombed in a terrorist attack. Late night, no, or no, early morning, it was around five your time. And if the imam would have been in the wrong room in that building, we may well have lost him. The people who did the bombing were a group called the White Rabbit Militia. They're from Illinois. Mm -hmm. They got in the car and drove all night to go bomb some people who were at worship. But it's not just a Muslim community. We know the Sikh community had a mass shooting a few years ago. We know that the Mother Mandy Moss, nine worshippers shot. And we know the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue, 11 people shot down in worship. And we know that Charlottesville, they're walking around with tiki torches, talking about you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, all this kind of stuff. Ran a car into a group of uh, <coughs> protesters to kill somebody. And the president says, well, you know, 
good people on both sides. What's my point? The Muslim community is in the middle of this, of this we're in the United States is in the middle of this, this organized hate movement. <clears throat> what are we going to do about it? I tell you one thing we can't do, hide the mosque. Can't go hide in the mosque. Because if you hide in the mosque, they come to the mosque. They've already shown that they'll hurt you in the Quebec City. They shot up a mosque there. You know, so it is critical that whether it is health care access, immigration, uh, organized right wing, uh, or anything, the Muslim community can ill afford to go uh, just hunker down and hope for the best. So you all spending a Sunday getting together the Muslim <coughs> political voice in Illinois is absolutely critical. I want to salute you. I want to thank you and for your leadership, your sacrifice, your commitment is absolutely great. I love the diversity of the room. Uh, I love the fact that we have folks here who, like myself who might be eyeballing, you know, retirement, you know, I'm 55. And we got some other folks who look like they're, I don't know, just out of high school or something, you know. <laughs> it's good to have the generational interconnectedness, right? It's good to have people from various communities. It's good to have folks from, uh, some folks who have other faiths. It's good to have some of our uh, elected leaders and candidates here. I want to say hi, hi to you, Senator. It's good to see you again. I thought you were another one who ran a brilliant campaign, raised critical issues. But if you didn't raise it, maybe nobody would. Mm -hmm. So you did us a great service by your run. I want to say thank you for that. Uh, let me just talk about a few things that I think we need to do uh, in a few just reflections. Maybe we can do some Q&A. But they're on my mind, things to do. It's critical to understand that we've got to get more people running. So this, I hope, is part of that. When people think about being a candidate, oftentimes they're like, man, I never did that before. I don't know. It's really tough. You should know that women tend to be extremely well qualified, but have doubts about whether they should run. Men, you know, it doesn't matter. This guy could be an intern, barely knows how to turn on the copy machine. He thinks he's supposed to be president. <laughs> but the sister's got a PhD, been running organizations, mobilizing people and raising money. And you're like, would you run away for school board? She's like, I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> so we got to encourage the sisters to run. It's a really good idea. And so, uh, you know, your example, Delara, again, very important. And uh, anybody here thinking about running for office, by the way, female, female? Very important. So we get out, we get more hands don't up. Don't be shy. I know there's a lot of people here. Who uh, are thinking I said about thinking it. about it. I didn't ask you to sign anything in blood, you know, <laughs> thinking about it. Well, I want you all, I want, okay, so if you're not thinking about it, I want to now formally ask you to think about it. And let me just say this, some of you all, you know, are thinking, you know, Brother Keith, I've been, did a whole career, you know, and now I'm 65, 66, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to run. I'm telling you, if you get on that school board or that city council, you're going to be the only adult in the room. We need somebody to say, what is the sensible, logical, practical thing to do, mm -hmm. right? And as you guys are jockeying for, you know, who's the most smartest person and all that, you, as that person who's done a career, might be the one to help bring folks to consensus so, and give people some institutional memory. Some of you guys in your 20s, you might think, I don't know if I'm, might be too young, might not have enough experience. We need that fire and that invigoration in your brain. You're going to be very helpful. You're going to move the board to new heights. You know, people, some of my friends born in other countries, they tell you I have an accent. You know, let me tell you, that people don't care. The heart knows the heart. I guarantee you. They'll vote for you. And, and of course, uh, we already talked about that group that has the parents. Maybe you're taking care of your 80-year-old dad and you're raising your 17-year-old son. Well, who knows better the challenges of a modern American family than you, right? So we need you to think in terms of yourself and what you bring. If you are an immigrant, you have to take a test to become a US citizen. You probably know more about American history and culture than 
the rest of us who was born here. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. You know, and you know, and, and there's and as you know, some of you, like my friend Ilhan, can tell you, look, don't lecture me about democracy. I left a country that didn't have it. Mm -hmm. I know how precious it is, you know, and I take grave offense when people snatch it away. So think about your assets, your experience, and think about how those things will benefit the people in your district. If you want to run, because it would be awesome it, to have the honorable in front of your name, please don't run. <laughs> we don't need any ego-motivated people. Please don't run. But if you have public service at the core of your motivation, please do run. Please do run. You don't have to do it forever. You can do it a couple of terms. It doesn't have to be a career. But give it a shot. And, and I would encourage you to do that. A few things to keep in mind. One, fundraising. You all think, oh man, how do I raise the money? Let me just tell you, raising money is like raising votes. You go to your, you start with the people who you know, and you don't tell them to give you money because you got enough shoes, enough clothes, you have enough, you have meals. You're not, at, you're not spending the money yourself. What you're asking them to do is to share in your vision for a more inclusive, fairer, greener Illinois. And you need money to do it. Trust me, this is something about donors that you should know. They're not giving you money that they don't have. You're not putting nobody in the poorhouse if they're asking you for a donation. Even if they give you a max out check, believe me, they can give you five max out checks. Mm -hmm. Nobody's broke who's doing a political campaign donation. So don't be shy about doing it. And I say this to you because that was the toughest thing for me to do when I started. I hated fundraising. And I still don't like call time. But the way I conceived of it is, I'm, ask, I'm inviting people to participate in a more inclusive vision for our country. And if you can't support it, support it, right? And people, shockingly, to my surprise, they write. And I'm thankful for it. But look at fundraising like friend raising, right? And don't look at it as you're asking them to give you money, because that's actually what's that's not actually happening. They're actually helping you to fund your campaign. And let me just tell you this. Be wary of them. If, if, you, if people will not fund your campaign, maybe you don't need to be in office. You hear what I just said? I know, I know look, I'm not, look, I'm, I'm from Minnesota. I'm going to get on a plane and, so I can say crazy stuff if I want to. <laughs> The idea that we can only have billionaires represent us is not that great of an idea. Now, I'm not against people with a lot of money. I'd like to be one of them one day. But I do. But even if I had a lot of money, I don't have a lot of money. I would still ask my friends for their 50s and their 100s and their 25s. You know why? It's an indicator of support. If somebody's not going to write for you, they don't believe it, they, you're any good. And so if the only one who thinks you're any good is you, because you, you're sitting on some massive fortune, then maybe you're the only person who's willing to vote for you. Now you can buy advertisements and trick people into thinking you're great, but trust me, you should set a financial limit on how much you're gonna give to your own campaign. <coughs> this is just Brother Keith's opinion. You know how much I've given, I've been, I've been on the ballot two times for state legislature, six times for Congress, and one time for Attorney General. You know how much money I've given myself? Total, 500 bucks. Because I told myself, if they don't want me, then, they, then they're not gonna fund my campaign. If they do, then they are. Think of it that way. It'll make you make more calls, right? And then people are gonna give you money, they wanna talk to you a little bit. Well, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it? This is great. You tell them, because guess what? They're going to get off the phone and talk to people about it. Look at fundraising as friend raising. Here's another thing, and let me tell you. I was the deputy chair of the Democratic National Committee. Because of my exhaustive duties trying to be a, uh, the Minnesota Attorney General, I could barely do anything other than that. And so I decided that I needed to resign. Um, but I just want to tell you, I know a lot about how the Democratic Party works. There's some Democratic conventionalities that we need to abandon. 
Democrats tend to, not all, but in general, tend to look at the people who are already going to vote and try to get them to vote for them. That's done. I don't know. Somebody needs to tell the Democratic Party that whoever gets the more votes, at least in a state or local election, wins. Now, that might not be true for the president, but it's true for everything else. So what should we do? Get the non-voter. Get the occasional voter. Get the infrequent voter. I talked to a lady. She got to be a pretty good friend of mine. I said, honey, you going to vote? She's about 75. She is the lunch lady. And if she's the lunch lady at the school, guess what else she is? The breakfast lady. So she gets to the school to do her shift at 6. Polls open at 7, right? So she's there. And then after breakfast is over, what's next? Lunch. Right. And she's got to clean these big industrial uh, cookers and stuff. So she, she's done with bre cleaning up after breakfast at 10 a.m. She's starting lunch at 10.01. And she's done cleaning up after lunch at around 2.30. Then she gets on a bus and goes to a senior center to cook for them. And that's her day. She does it, and then she does it all over again. Gets off around 7.30. You're thinking, oh, well, she can vote then. She's dead tired. She might even forget. Early voting is a working people's program. The, the Illinois Democratic Muslim Coalition needs to work and think about and contemplate early voting. We need to work that early voting, big time. And we need to contemplate the infrequent voter. Where do they live? Where do they go? Why, what is their motivation? Why don't they vote? Some of us folks who are middle class and up, we're real sanctimonious about not voting, aren't we? Let's be honest. Oh, how dare you not vote? Don't you know about democracy? Wait a minute. You don't work a double shift, buddy. You don't know what that is. You don't have, you're not transit dependent. We've got to contemplate the non-voter. People want to vote. They actually do want to vote. It's not apathy. It's that people don't have the time. Well, you know, the step public statistics will tell you why did people vote? They didn't have time. And, the, and, and when you think about the fact that no matter what your political affiliation is, no matter what your political affiliation is, if you make more than $150,000 a year, you're voting at the 80% level. Why? Because if you make that kind of cheese, you get in when you, when you, you know, you might work really hard. But if that day you call your secretary and say, I'm going to be in a little late today, right? Come on, talk back to me. This is audience participation. <laughs> if you make it that kind of money, 120, 150, you, you can afford it. And what is it? It's not just the money. It's the discretionary time. It's the control over your day. If you're making that money, you're not punching the clock, right? Yes. Yeah. So we who want to mobilize voters need to think about early vote, need to think about what, need to think about the infrequent voter. We should post up on campus. And don't forget the high schools. There's a whole lot of people 18 years old on the high school campus. <coughs> I think the Illinois Muslim Coalition should think about proposing 16-year-old vote. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But let me tell you something about that. They drive. They're legally allowed to, to push a piece of stuff. A hunk of steel weighing 2,000 pounds. That's a lot of responsibility. If you have to 16 vote, then, then, then you, the, the, the civics teacher has every reason to teach about the election, right? And you get them in the habit of voting. You know how you, know, you keep somebody voting, you start the voting, and then do it again, do it again, do it again. So those are a few some things that I think that we need to seriously consider. Now, thank God. Illinois Muslim Democrats have a day on the hill. You guys go down to Springfield once a year at least. And that's a great thing. My ask for you today is to challenge yourself to do a little bit more. Who was there last year? How many people did we get? Can we go up by 10%? I think Abdullah will know that answer, right? It's a rhetorical question, sister. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but if Abdullah wants to answer the question, I'm happy to do that. But, yeah, look, let's keep it at rhetorical. Look, yeah. <laughs> and if you want to have any visual evidence, go to the website. There's a picture up there. Leave them. But even if you did Gangbusters last time, Abdullah, yeah. 
do gangbusters plus 10%. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what I mean? And, you know, and, and then look at the crowd. Let's just say everybody there was, I don't know who was there. So let's just say everybody there was African-American. Well, let's go recruit in the Bangladesh community. Let's go recruit in the Bosnian community. Let's go re recruit in the Pakistani community. Let's let's get bigger. Let's let's just say it was a bunch of guys there. And if you're around Muslims, you know guys, you know we got a problem with this. I was at a meeting yesterday. God bless everybody there. I love them all. They're all my people. I do anything for them. Too much testosterone. Sorry. <laughs> something, something I noticed. Just one woman out of all of those people on the stage over there. Was not right now. I'm not casting blame. I'm not trying to beat anyone down. I'm trying to beat them up. You know what I mean? I'm not saying anybody's bad. I'm just saying we got to do a little better. That's not right. Remember, it's the believing men and the believing women. It's not just one. Yes, ma'am. I know that you asked a rhetorical question, but I just really want to bring it back to reality. So um, we've all talked about Congress um, and the Senate and the every year. Congress or well, state judge, legislature? The Hill, Congress. Um, okay, fair enough. Yeah, uh, so it's part of the National Arab American De um, Advocacy Week. So we go for two days on the Hill, we meet with our local congressmen and so forth, and these are about 24 states and across the country that meet up every year. I remember about 10 years ago when I called Congressman Lipinski's office the first couple of years, and I was this is Arab American. And, and it happened for a couple of years, but to your point, and his staff would say, well, our chief, our staff on foreign policy is not here. <laughs> Mind you, I didn't even finish my organization's name. <laughs> and I said, but I'm not calling for the foreign policy. I'm calling to make an appointment to come and visit your office as Arab American Family Services, part of the National Network for Arab American Communities, to address local issues like employment, human services, elderly, and so forth. And I tell you, it took three, four years before they started realizing, oh, you're the same group, and you're not here about foreign policy, but you're here about local issues and national issues that impact our community. And, and it was about, we're on our 15th year now. But before that, I hardly saw Arab Americans, and I hardly saw Muslim Americans. And now you do, because of your leadership. But to your point, I think it's seeing more of us. And I think that if, as the Illinois Muslim Coalition, I think that is a great, great strategy and initiative moving forward. Just really bring visibility to, visibility to the Muslim community on the Hill. Well, let me commend you for your persistence. Can I just, I mean, look, I'm not in Congress anymore, so I'm just going to be brutally honest. <laughs> you know, Dan Lipinski, you know, you may like him or you may not like him, but he's not regarded as one of the most responsive people. I'm, I'm just, you know, hey, look, I don't care if y'all go tell him, well, you don't care what's said about you. Look, he might be a great friend of yours. Maybe he's not. I'm not here to... I'm here to tell you the truth as well as I understand. And look, this wasn't my issue as much as saying that from the 24 states. Yeah. I mean, I had the direct experience of their staff, regardless what state, their staff related Arab Americans with foreign policy. Right. And I think that's what, I mean, to the message here as a community, if you want them to recognize they love you, we really have to be there. We have to be visible. Well, I just want to say you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and, and you know, you know, and, and as you talk, a few thoughts do strike me. One is, absolutely, we've got to emphasize the domestic realities. Yeah. See, hate crimes is domestic. That's here, right? Healthcare is domestic. And does anyone in this room know a diabetic? Mm -hmm. So Muslims don't have diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, the price of insulin has gone up twelve hundred percent in the last twenty years. Let me tell you. I mean, I'm telling you that we should be talking about drug prices. The Muslim community is rich in medical talent. We should be making medical policy. <clears throat> and the Muslim community is, is and, and let me also say this about staff, because you mentioned staff. Your ideal congressional or state legislative meeting is with the member. You want to meet with the member. But honestly, it's hard for members to be able to know where they're going to be on any given day. Lord knows people show up in my office and I'm halfway across Washington doing this or that. You know, if everybody nailed me because I wasn't sitting in my office, I'd get nailed way more than I do. But 
I will tell you, so if you do meet with staff, meet with them. Know this about staff. Members got 50 things they're trying to figure out in any given moment, but staff tend to be dedicated to, uh, they used to, used to have a portfolio. So it's not a bad thing to meet with staff. When you meet with staff, have some paper to give them. Tell them about your issue, and then follow up with another piece of paper. You want to get them on your mind. That's probably why it got through to Lipinski staff that y'all were there on domestic issues, because you kept at it. But, but I don't want anybody to think, oh, staff, it wasn't a good day. No, it, it could be a very good day, meaning the staff, maybe staff know more about the issue than the member. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of times when I'll go to staff and say, OK, what, what are you recommending that I do on this issue or that issue? So that's an important thing to know about staff. Um, the other thing to know, and so thank you for you, your point sparked a few issues in my mind. So thank you for raising that. Anybody else? Let's, let's do some Q&A. Yep. Congressman, you've been a, a beacon for of leadership uh, for our community. And um, with you going uh, home to Minnesota, and congratulations again on your victory, um, what's your, I guess, how do you, you've been a leader for us? Yep. Um, I'm not going anywhere. OK. And I'm wondering what, how, how <coughs> and you're like, well, why not? You're not staying involved in, in Continue to inspire people to be involved in the process, whether they choose to run or not. Well, um, so I'm here today, right? Yep. Um, in, in, in about two weeks, I won't be in Congress anymore, but I'm still here. One reason I'm here is because, you know, I'm, I care about you. And the other reason I was with the USA Muslim Coalition of Organizations last night. <coughs> I, I might have mangled that name. USMOC. It must, yeah, USMOC. Yeah. But, but, but the point is that, um, no. you know, I'm going to keep doing it. But here's the real meat of what you're asking me. This morning I spent time talking to Kwame Rao. Who knows who he is? Tell me who he is. Somebody, somebody. Attorney General, Attorney General of Illinois. Attorney, Gen Attorney General elect yeah. and current state senator. Yeah. And he and I were talking in downtown Chicago this morning about, I mean, I'm not going to speak for Kwame, he speaks for pretty well for himself. That's why he won a state tw twice as big as mine. But we talked about the Sprint T-Mobile merger. We talked about drug pricing. We talked about, right, like all kinds of stuff. So I, another ask I have for you all is to contact Kwame, get him in a room like this one, and chop it up <coughs> with him. Build that relationship. Here's the other thing. Well, this is something that I didn't understand before I was in politics, but I understand now. There's no perfect politician. Even I don't like my service sometimes. If you're one of those folks who's so idealistic that any politician who does anything you don't like ever, you hate them now, I'll never vote for you again. Because, you know, I get letters like that. We all do. I bet you've gotten a few. Watch out. <laughs> well, here's my point. Here's my point. Get them in the room. Build a relationship before there's a problem. Then when there is a problem, you discuss it within the relationship. And then you don't go at them. Because it's easy to go at politicians, right? Because, I mean, we see them on TV. They're not real people. They don't actually have feelings. We, you know, right? We can say whatever we want to them, embarrass them, put them on the spot, whatever we want to do, because that's how we do things in America. But the truth is, you are talking to a real person with kids and a family who, you know, who do the best they can, you know. And so, when you raise an issue with them, which is their obligation to answer you, raise it within the context of a relationship. And if you still have to put them on blast, then you do. But at least you've tried to figure out a better way forward. You know, I'm not going to name this person, but there's a politician who attended a meeting that some of their supporters thought they should not attend based on that group's position. I was proud that many of you Illinoisans and try to engage them first. Because, you know, you can, people can do better. I mean, we say, we say, this uh, is the law of Rahim, do we not? Yes. The most beneficent, the most merciful. 
Oh, I, I might be merciful, but we not. <laughs> we want blood, we want revenge, we want to put you on the spot, we want to punish. I'm, I'm telling you, we, we should try to engage people before there's a problem. And so I would urge you to get Pritzker in here, get Raul in here, get them all in here, talk to them. And so like, like you can always go have a press conference on denounce them. And I believe that's appropriate many, on many occasions. But before you do, at least hear him out, right? I wanted yeah. to thank you. Last time Keith was here, he said, you've got to connect with Kwame Raul. And of course, I know him, but yeah, Senator, you know, many you, of us know us. We talked like, about we, you. We talked about where you were this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but because not only did you say reach out to him again, Delara, yeah. you connected us. Yeah. So now, actually, we're connecting with him in January. So, And then uh, J.B. Pritzker's team just reached out this week and uh, invited us to the inauguration. So See, small that's awesome. steps. Yeah, um, inshallah. And what we pushed back is, will you give us more tickets because our coalition is 250 people strong? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, look, you know, us some ideas. that is how it's done, right? Yeah. And as you say that, it inspires me to tell you this other thing. One of the most important things you could, and you, many of you already know this, for those of you <coughs> who are not sure about this, just hear me out, okay? Just hear me out. <clears throat> I, there's a tendency in the Muslim community, and not only the Muslim community, many communities, but it's here too, to take essentially a moral um, sort of approach to what is inherently a political process. Now, I'm not saying you should be immoral. I'm simply saying that politics in the state legislature of Illinois and the U.S. Congress are not necessarily immoral institutions, and they're not moral institutions, they're amoral institutions. Yeah. And, and, and what that means is they respond to pressure and engagement. They don't respond to morality. Now, sometimes they do the right thing. <laughs> sometimes they don't. But they never do it because it's right. They do it because a bunch of people are demanding it. Yes. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. I can't tell you how many people would be like, this is wrong, I got a panel table. And I'm like, yeah, but you still got to organize. <laughs> One, this is a political law of gravity. I'm about to give you a political law. No matter how trivial, stupid, and insignificant an issue may be, if there is a constituency that will persistently push for it, it will happen. No, I'm like, look, I'm not saying what should be. I'm telling you what is. I mean, you're mad at me because I said gravity will pull smaller bodies to the larger body. That's not. I don't think it should be that way. It is that way. It, does everybody follow what I'm telling? You? Yeah. So if you think something is moral and good and right, that's good. You feel that way, but you got to go mobilize other people who agree with you to also do that and then you can get where you're going. If you think, well, it's clearly, it's clearly evident that everybody should have health care, <coughs> why don't they do it? Well, because a lot of people make money on folks not having health care. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of an insurance company? They don't make money paying claims. They make money denying <coughs> claims. Sorry for those in the insurance business. <laughs> but it's true. So anyway, let's keep going. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good to see you, brother. Good to see you again. Thank you so much for coming. So first really important news, the Bears are at 14 to 3. Oh, you had to And the Vikings are at 21 to 7. Oh, that's even better. So just real quick, I just wanted to just maybe kind of comment and get your feedback. So <laughs> Khalil Mack, oh my god, that guy's oh, a yeah. <laughs> Oh, he's a monster. Anyway, so, sorry. Um, so basically, uh, you know, a couple times I've heard you speak, you know, the first thing that resonates to me is your humility. I mean, you are just such a down-to-earth person. You really relate to people, uh, be it in your constituency or any audience. And I think that's just an amazing uh, trait. And I, I don't know if that's something you know people develop or born with. But the point is, the Muslim community were very new into this realm of politics. You know, some like uh, Brother Moon Khan have been in it for many years, but yep. the majority of people are, are fairly new. And I really think that the understanding of humility, the understanding of 
you know, making people feel, even though you know you may agree with them or not, uh, that they are that you are, you know, representing them as a critical element that will learn over time. But maybe you can give a couple thoughts of wisdom about, you know, that type of experience as a as a seasoned politician to a number of people in our community who are new into their elected positions. Well, let me just say, brother, thank you for that kind word. Here's what, my definition of humility is this. It's the simple recognition that, boy, you, first of all, you're going to die, for sure. You don't know everything, not even half, not even close. All of us are smarter than any one of us. And if you actually want to, if you want to win, you better draw up on the talents of all. Mm -hmm. That's my two cents. That's my, where I'm coming from. I mean, I, I fail so much that I'm just very acutely aware of my own limitation. And if you were to tabulate all the time that has ever transpired and then compare that to the amount of time I'm on the planet, it's not even that long. And that goes for all of us. The other thing about humility is life is so subjective, isn't it? Every meal I've ever had, I tasted it. You didn't. Everything I've ever seen came out of my eyes, not yours. It's very, it, by, and by the way, I'm absolutely unique. My irises, you can pick me out of a billion people. My DNA, I spit in the cup, you can pick me out of a billion people. And here's the interesting thing, each one of us is the same, exact same way. So we see ourselves as unique, because we are. But in our uniqueness, we're exactly the same. Isn't that ironic? That's kind of wild when you think, for me it is kind of crazy when you think about it. I would just say that it is important as a person who is, is, is identifies as a Muslim to <coughs> to pray, to ask forgiveness, to give thanks a lot. And if you do that, you can avoid the seduction of power that will ruin you for sure. You follow what I'm saying? No. I mean, it's all illusory. One day you got power, the next day you don't. Eight years, Obama was ruler of the universe. Now he's a private citizen. He has a lot of juice but not like before, he cannot call up CENTCOM and say, do this, do that. He can't call the Treasury and do it. But he could. Power's an illusory thing. Sometimes you have it, next time you don't. Most of it's illusory. So I would just say do that. I said a little earlier that if you're running for office because you think, because you're, you'd be, your mom would be so proud of you, don't run. <laughs> don't run. Don't run. Don't run. I'm going to tell you whatever scares me. Not, so I might piss off some people, so please forgive me for this. But whenever I hear somebody start a speech with, whenever I think that a poor child from where I came from, overcoming all I came from, doing all the things that I did, and now here I am, a member of the US Congress. God bless America. I think to myself, it's all about you. That's what I think. I think. No, give me a speech about how you're motivated by service, right? Give me a speech about how you, how you are here to make other people's lives better. That's what we really, I think that's what we need. So thanks for that question. I think it's really, it's a good question for, for this meeting because we can jump right into targeting and fundraising and all of the, all of the, flood, all of the easy stuff. But really, public service and politics is that it starts here. It's in here. And so, thanks for that. I think I've got about time for, uh, th I think i got three minutes. i got a one out of here. One. Yep. So, uh, we met in Manhattan. So we'll see you again. Then we met in Massachusetts twice. We're just hanging out. I know. <laughs> so, so I truly appreciate your public service because those were not your congressional districts when you were out there. And you were talking to Muslim communities right. in all the relevant contexts. So my question is, I ran for public office. I lost by 2%. Hey, let's give him a hand. <laughs> so back, the conversation was to just run for public office. Now the conversation is to how to continue that stream. So uh, I'm going to use you as a free therapy session. What what advice do you have for me that I should continue to do that path? Because people still need you. They still need you. Look, um, I've run and I've lost, 
it hurts. Because no matter what the odds were when you started, no matter how bad the odds were when you started, no matter how much anyone said, a person like you cannot win in a district like that. In the beginning, they tell you that. But once you decide to try it, you literally convince yourself, I'm going to win. <laughs> and then when you don't, it's like, what? <laughs> and then you're like, oh, man. and then you go through all the stages of like grief, right? You know? <laughs> but at the end of the day, you didn't get in it just so people could call you the honorable blah, 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 right? Yes. You got in it because you felt a compelling need to make life better for your neighbors. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. So I say jump back in. Understanding this too, Martin Luther King never held any political office. Gandhi never held political office. Names Dorothy Day never held political office. Mm -hmm. You can change the world, not in political office. Mm -hmm. This is a very critical thing for any office holder to understand. All power doesn't reside with you. <coughs> in fact, the more you can mobilize people who are not in office, the more powerful you can be. Am I right about this? Yeah. Right? When I ran around, I, I, I go to those, I go to districts outside of my own and I'm gonna continue to do so, God willing, because uh, I, 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 it's, in a way it's selfish. I like organizing, it's fun to me. So I get some out of it and I'm gonna keep it up because uh, there's so much more to do. You know, in 1968, the average CEO made 20 times the average worker. Today it's 339 times. Wow. All the money is flowing up this way and they don't just stop there. I wish they did just take the money and buy yachts and, and luxury apartments. They don't. They buy senators. Mm -hmm. They buy they buy offices. And so now, political economic co concentration of power is now is now bled into <coughs> political power. And now we're actually lurching toward what's known as oligopoly or plutocracy. What is plutocracy? Anybody? Few people run it. That's oligopoly. Plutocracy is rulership of the rich. And we think we pride ourselves on having a democratic society. How different are we from Saudi Arabia? You know what I mean? You know, with many of my dear friends in the Muslim community fled places like that. Let's not remake it here, right? Let's not remake it here. Let's keep it so that people can control their destiny. Let's do two more, then I got to hit the door. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, a little bit earlier there was a who asked the question who wants to run for office and there was a lot of reluctance in the room to be to come forward. Uh, I remember about 20 years ago, people like Dick Hephart had uh, teams where they would identify candidates. They were not necessarily people who were not even political. They were in the corporate world, business world, professionals, whatever. And they would they, there would be a dance, a long dance, where they would court these people and finally, Dick Gephardt would go and try to close the deal on the one on one knee. Um, would you be open to something like that? If you I, could I, I would be, closer. I, I would be up for that, but I don't want to be uh, a kingmaker. You know what I mean? I'd be up for it. I'll call, I'll come, I'll do my part. But I tell you, somebody asked me, who do you think should run for president, Keith? I said, that ain't even the question. Let them, let them all get out there. Let them compete. Let them run. Let's see who can get some support. You know, in my opinion, the problem with the last presidential is, you know, we had one person who said, this is their turn. And we all kind of collapsed. And so once the community decides kind of who they want, I'll be more than happy to help close. But let's get this organic bubble up from the ground process understanding that we need people in their 60s, we need people in their 20s, we need people in their 40s, we need people male, we need people female, we need people of all ethnic groups, we need people, we need hijabis, we need sisters who don't wear hijab, you know? We need, we need everybody, we need, we need the family, right? And, 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 and we're all better off when everybody uh, gets a shot and everybody has something, I mean, if you ever put together one of them jigsaw puzzles, it's got 500 pieces, you need them all to make the puzzle look the picture right, you know? And they all lock into each other in a unique way. I think this is gonna have to be my last one. I do, I, okay, I'm gonna take both of you guys. Um, I have a question um, related more to young people in politics. All right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I feel like my 
blockchain is a huge issue on a lot of our minds. You're right. It's never treated as the central issue for any politician, um, despite them talking about how important um, youth involvement is. And so I'm wondering, how do we force politicians to actually prioritize issues that matter to young people that will actually energize them to want to get involved? Okay, I'm going to tell you a political law. I already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Any issue, no matter how meritorious and important, that people don't organize persistently around is not getting anywhere. Particularly when there's organized opposition. I mean, people like to make a lot of money on coal and oil and natural gas. I mean, fortunes are made on that. And you're trying to change that? You think they're going to just give it up to you because it's because of climate change? You think just because the earth is literally heating up to the point where human beings can't live on it, they're going to give up all their money? They will watch this sucker burn and build some, you know, build some thing for themselves. I mean, don't you know, read about Elon Musk. He wants to have a, his own little spaceship for rich people, right? <coughs> don't ever underestimate the insanity of greedy people. However bad you think they are, they're twice as bad as that. So is it possible for us to actually push for something like a Green New Deal? Is it possible for Because there is a constituency I, for it. I would say not only is it possible, it is fundamentally essential. But if I may, dear sister, <coughs> if you come to me and say, nobody anywhere is doing this thing that I think is important, the thing that pops in my mind is, what about you? Are you pushing for it? Well, if you're pushing for it, then somebody is pushing for it. I mean, we often like to, I just want us to think about our own agency. And when I get up and I say, nobody's doing anything about this, I, right? I just said, I, I'm not because I'm somebody. So if nobody is, then I'm not. And no politician, I know politicians who are, right? And then sometimes we do a variation of that. Well, the, the only politician doing it is this person. Probably not true either. The bottom line is we got to build the coalition. It's hard work. It's not easy. And it's one by one by one. There's no easy way around it. And you got to build people. And, it, and, it's easier to, and it's easier to invite someone in than to call them out. It's more emotionally satisfying to call them out. Ooh, it's fun to call people out. You failed to do this. Boy, we just get a thrill doing that. <laughs> but guess what? It don't do nothing. You know what? It's better to call somebody in. Hey, you know, Congressman, did you know about the Green New Deal? You know, I can send you some stuff on it. Can we set up a call? Can we do a meeting? Next thing you know, you made a friend. As opposed to the first way, where it's like, that person embarrassed me. I don't want to talk to them. See what I'm saying? You can always call out the people who need to get called out. Try to build that bridge first. Uh, you're the last one, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm going to start with a little joke and then I have a question. I love yeah. jokes. I love jokes. Don't, don't, don't take an offense. So you know, you were the first Muslim uh, elected to the Congress, as I recall, and the first statewide president. <coughs> so by definition, that makes you the Khalifa. Khalifa the Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Everybody can now address me as Khalifa. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really is a joke. <laughs> that is a joke. Right? Right. So my, uh, my serious question, Mr. Khalifa, is uh, you know, a lot of us, what we see today, and, and some of us who've been in trenches for a long time, we couldn't get the traction we could. And thanks to the devil uh, in, in, the, in the White House, we all got excited and we all got energized and everyone is running, everyone is giving money. Now I call people, they want, they, they want to give to me, they want to help me. Me and my wife, who, my wife who never was involved in politics, did phone banking and all that stuff. So yeah. the question is, sir, being the you know visionary leader that you are, once we get rid of this guy from the White House in 2020, have a Democrat in charge. I'm 100% sure. If that's so <laughs> How do you see the, the Muslim political activism? <coughs> what steps do you, do you think we should take now <coughs> to make sure this the work hard work that Delara has been doing, some other people are doing, you been doing, continues. And and, and with my credit to uh, Senator Chris, that we get to the level of the Jewish Americans who represent 8.4% in the Congress. 
So right now, what are we? 0.1% in the Congress or 1% in the Congress? So my goal is to be at this level, how do we continue? I mean, I think they have a different history, the Jewish folks, and I can understand that our history is different. So how do you put this together, sir? Well, you know, just as an aside, interesting thing, you should read about Jewish political history in the United States. In the 1950s, there was rapid, open anti-Semitism. It was ugly, and it was bad. There was a guy named Father Coghlan, the Catholic priest in Detroit, and used to get up there and talk about the Jewish conspiracy. He still was nasty. I don't think that there was any more. In 1950, I bet you there weren't no more than about three or four Jews in Congress, and many of them weren't that open about it, right? You know, the Muslim community, Samir turns into Sam sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Jews did the same thing. People are people. And yet, you know, folks started running. They started saying, you know, some of the, I'm sure they were told, you know, you're Jewish. Nobody's going to vote for you. But there's a little guy named Paul Wellstone who was my political hero. And he was, he ran for office. He doesn't look nothing like a politician. If you can believe it, he's even shorter than I am. And he, uh, but, he, but the, he was so electrifying, so sincere, and so great. People just voted for him. And then he, he married a woman who was not Jewish. So his opponent, who was Jewish and married to a Jewish woman, gets up and writes a letter saying, he's not Jewish enough. <laughs> but the letter got out. And then everybody was offended by that. Gave him two or three points. He ends up winning the election in 1992. Paul Wellstone. I just share you with you that because I don't want the Muslim community to think that we're the only ones who've had a tough go. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not true. And um, today, there's there are tons of reasons that we should find coalition with Jewish community. Um, this thing with synagogue, man. Let me tell you, this is not a one. This is not an isolated thing. I'm telling you now, it's going to get better before it, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I don't want. I wish it would get better before it got worse. But I'm just looking at the signs, and I'm reading them like getting worse first. So, you, the core of your question, I think, is absolutely essential to be answered today. We cannot have politics of personality. We gotta get rid of it, rid of it. We gotta have political machinery that replicates results, no matter who's running. If the only way we get a president we like is because they're as eloquent and brilliant as Barack Obama, then we ain't gonna have too many. And if the only way we get a majority in the House is we get a president as awful as Trump, we're not going to have too many. We need to have replicable political outcomes. That depends upon what you're doing right here, right now, kabam. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you this, this is going to have to be my last comment. One of the th you guys are, are in good company. You're doing exactly the right thing. In Minnesota, when I was, you know, I was running, trying to be win statewide. Nobody, uh, you know, knew what was the outcome going to be. So we worked really hard. And so, we one night, I mean, we, we had a, a, a Muslim coalition group, and they knocked on. They made thirteen thousand calls in one night. And, they, and 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 sometimes they made nine thousand. Some they made maybe six thousand. But they did that for like more than a month. And the real stars of the election was not me or anybody else. It was these young people, and not some young people, quite frankly, who were in a room dialing, talking to their neighbors about the importance of getting out to vote. In my congressional district, which is no longer my congressional district, we got 267,000 votes <coughs> in my district, congressional district alone. I think that might be certainly top three or four in the country. And you know, it helped us win. I won by a hundred thousand votes, and you know that that prop their effort probably <coughs> accounted for fifteen to eighteen percent of it. So organization is what's going to mean you can have somebody who's a really super great candidate, but they're not that great of a speech giver. <coughs> or you got somebody who's, you know, what I mean, political organization is what helps you overcome. I'm going to guarantee you this. One thing Muslims got to deal with is something called crisis control. In every campaign, 
something's going to happen that you don't expect that is that, that is going to mess you up and decide how are you going to get through it. If you have a political organization, you can. If you don't, you know one one bad story and you're sunk. You know what I mean. So with that, I want to just say, may God bless all of you and your work and your efforts. May may God bless each family represented here. Uh, and may all of us understand the importance of doing the work that we need to do in order to have success in 2019 and 2020. Uh, Barack Obama. Well, we're going to take a one minute break and then we'll come back to the next you know, panel. I wanted to take a photo with oh. uh, Senator Biss and Keith Ellison. Okay. And what, what should everybody come up here? Should I go back there? No.